Well, I have a chance today to speak on the, the Day of Atonement. And if you have the handout in front of you, you will see the title of my presentation is, The High Priest Had a Job to Do. The High Priest Had a Job to Do. I have the opportunity to share some thoughts about the Day of Atonement. And I'm intending in this presentation to read from the book of Hebrews. And I intend to ask you a question before I read from the book of Hebrews. And then I want to ask you the same question at the end of my reading of the book of Hebrews. Your answer may be the same, it may stay the same, but your answer may be a little bit different. And that's okay, because sometimes when we think about things differently, we consider new things, sometimes our answers change, and hopefully it change in a growth way, in a good way. The question I'm going to ask you today, now, and I'm going to ask you at the end, is why do you fast on the Day of Atonement? I'm not asking you to make any verbal comments. I'm asking you to make some mental notes, some mental thoughts. You may change your mind through the, the course of things. You may, ask, you may talk to people afterwards, but why do you fast on the Day of Atonement? Well, Bible students will quote two scriptures from the book of Leviticus. They will quote Leviticus 16, 29, and then the section of oh, Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32. The handout did not have the correct scripture there. So it's Leviticus 16, 29 and Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32. Both sections of scriptures talk about there was an instruction from God to afflict our souls, which is there's really not a lot of debate on what that was meant in, back in the Hebrew or in those who study the scriptures. It meant some form of fasting. Fasting was to be done. And so they feel, I would ask a lot of people, why do you fast on the Day of Atonement? Many people would quote to Leviticus 16, or they would, would quote Leviticus 23. And then, you know, for those, if you're a Bible student, that's admirable that you would know where to find that. There are many people who really wouldn't know where you, it talks about fasting in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But it would be admirable that you would know where that is. But again, I ask you, why do you fast on the Day of Atonement? Is it just because Leviticus says so? I think it's got to be a whole lot more than that, brethren and friends. It's got to be a whole lot more than that. You know, the Bible says, uh, don't steal, okay? So I could ask you why you don't rob a bank. And you may say, well, because the Bible says don't steal. Is that the only reason why you don't rob a bank? You might have some coveting problems. You might have some lust problems. You might have some boundary issues. You might have other problems. Why do you not commit adultery? We well, say because the Bible says not to. So because the Bible says not to is the only reason why you don't commit adultery? Really? You see, there should be more growth there if that's the only reason. You know, you know people analyze, years ago, a long time ago, there were many people who followed an instruction about they didn't eat unclean meat. And then the church they were in said, we as the leaders say it's okay. So people that night ate unclean meat that night. Which I would ask the question, if, you know, whatever people want to conclude on that's up to them, but I guess they could say they either didn't believe it all the way along, or if they were convinced over one sermon or one discussion that it was okay, that seems a little bit flimsy to me. Other, and maybe they said they never believed it, but they just wanted to go along. Okay, that would, that would make more sense to me. But if someone says, makes a comment to you, here's the, what the scripture says, it, hopefully you're thinking about why does the scripture say that? What's God's purpose? What is the value of doing this? So I'm asking you today, why do you fast on the Day of Atonement? You can quote Leviticus 16 to me. You can quote Leviticus 23 to me. By the way, I, I, I like fasting on the Day of Atonement. I recommend we fast on the Day of Atonement. I teach we fast on the Day of Atonement. But I would like to ask every one of you to consider why you're doing it. Because I don't think it's exactly for the same reason that maybe you did 20, 30 years ago. Certainly your answer is more than I read it in the Bible. Well, I want to kind of set a, a, a pace up here. So I'm going to get some volunteers from the audience here. I'm going to bring up uh, Jim Bald. I want, could you come forward? And could you bring two helpers, 
fact, why don't you, you've got two boys, bring your boys up here. That's a, they can be your helpers. Jim Ball has talked to me about something he observed down in Mexico. I'd like him, as he was describing what he observed down in Mexico, I would like him to describe with words what he has seen down in Mexico. Because quite frankly, a lot of people who, in the church of God who fast on the Day of Atonement, fast on the Day of Atonement just like Mr. Ball is going to describe down in Mexico. And I'm going to tell you, if that's your reason for fasting on the Day of Atonement, you're missing the boat. Now, hopefully your sons are submissive young men. Could they kind of show the audience what you're going to describe? Back, <laughs> back when I was uh, fairly young, it was about, I was 14, and the, the memory is still etched deeply in my mind, and for those math whizzes of you, that was probably about 16 years ago, so <laughs> that was a joke. Um, I was blessed to travel extensively all through northern Mexico with my father. Um, he did baptizing tours and Bible studies and Sabbath services. And one, I can't remember exactly where it was in Mexico, but one day I was horrified as we were driving along a highway and we saw miles and miles and miles of people on their knees crawling in penance, going up to this mount where there were crosses stationed at the top of this mountain and these people were crawling on their knees on the asphalt and there was literally a red blood trail where you could see where these hundreds and hundreds of people were crawling on their knees and some of the people were whip, whipping themselves as they went along and various forms of, of punishment atonement I guess you would call it they were trying to appease God in some way for their sins and I remember as a 14 year old I was horrified that that people could think that God was such a capricious being that he would subject humans to to this kind of, of punishing to punish themselves but they um, some whipped themselves they almost all of them crawled on their knees except for the some few who were carrying crosses and um, after they got off the road, they still had another mile or so to go to the top of this mountain. And it, would, it, it must have been just excruciating, just excruciating. And at a 14-year-old, it stuck in my head, and, and it, was, it was horrifying. It really was. Give a round of applause. I like the way the guys got into it. Not, a, not enough blood, but otherwise it was pretty good. <laughs> I did ask them ahead of time if they would do that, so don't, I wouldn't pull that on you surprise for anyone, but I, they agreed to do that. And you, you saw the story that Mr. Bald verbally painted, and the boys showed, walk, and I, I was worried about them ruining their pants. I said, oh, you know, you're, you're in your nice dress pants, do you mind doing that? And of course, the young people do good things like that. But I think there's a lot of people all across the Church of God groups who are fasting today for the same reason those people are on their knees to the temple. And there might even be a few people in this room fasting today for the same reason. I would like to encourage you to think of a better reason for fasting on the Day of Atonement. In other words, if there is an instruction to fast and if there's a value to fast, what is the reason why we're fasting? What is the reason why you're fasting? Here's how this comes into play. Actually, finally, this year, I did not get a question from anybody on this regard. For the last 20 some years, I've had a question from one of our sweet senior citizens who said, is it okay for me to take my blood pressure medication on the Day of Atonement? And I guess after 20 some years of me repeating it over and over and over again, I've always encouraged you not to let those things get in the way of your fast. This fast was not this, I didn't have Michael and Thomas race up here to see who was the fastest one. And we're not having a race today to see who can afflict themselves the hardest today. Who can go without, who can go the longest? Who can go without more things? 
if you're taking five medications and I'm taking an aspirin, which I'm, I'm, I'm told I should take an aspirin every day, I've not been told I have to take medication, but does that mean you are better than me, you know, because you're giving up five medications, and I, by the way, I didn't give up my aspirin. I took my aspirin today. I could have easily ignored the aspirin. I took it deliberately today so I could make the point of the sermon. <laughs> But I want, I want those of you who wouldn't take the aspirin to judge me, if you will. I, I took the aspirin. Uh, it's, it's all I have to take. And if I had to take a blood pressure thing, I know some people, you can make the choice to say, on that day, I'm not going to do it. That's fine. But if you make the choice to say, on that day, I'm not going to do it because I'm better than Dave Haver, you got a problem. Or if you say, I, I, I'm not going to do this and yet you're going to feel more superior to someone who's got diabetes, I think you're missing the point of what this is all about. It's not about who can go the fastest, who can go the longest, who can go over most glass, who can go over most rocks. And for years I've been telling you, this is a day to fast, and you can construct your fast to work around your individual situation in life. For some people who are elderly, I think it's good. They may go on a two or three hour fast, either eat a little bit or take some medication and go on another two or three hour fast and eat a little bit and take some medication. Now, some of the hardcore people would say, no, it wasn't 24 hours with a hand covering the mouth, nothing going in. Well, we're just glad you're not the judge of the universe. We're just glad you're not the one evaluating what's going on. Now, again, I, I, we have some children here and I, I want to be real careful. I, I should have said this earlier, not today. I really don't think you should be forcing your kids to fast like you do at small ages. I think there's ways to introduce fasting concepts to them without having to be 24 hours of complete or whatever. There's ways to teach the lesson age appropriate and you can teach the lesson age appropriate to senior citizens. You're trying to teach the lesson age appropriate. And not, a, not every senior citizen does it the same. Not every family with kids do it the same. But I know, uh, I just would encourage, well, it's, it's too late now. I'll try to remember to say it next time, next year. I hope people with small children don't force their kids to fast. Where, you know, a lot of times what the kids do, you know what happens with a lot of the kids who fast, who are like 10 and 11 and 12? They go home and sleep. They sleep all day. They, they go to church. They're miserable. Sometimes their stomach churns. Sometimes they vomit a little bit. And then they go sleep the rest of the day away. And really, what message is that? How is that really a great message for what we're trying to do that day? But anyway, you can construct it. I realize if you, if you quote this to other Church of God people and Church of God preachers, they would think I'm loony or whatever. But that's okay. I'm not, they're not my judge either. And I think someday they're going to realize, you know, that Haver had something. He had something I wish I would have had back in 2018. I wish I'd seen that sooner. He saw that part. Some things they see sooner than me, but then someday they're going to say, he saw that sooner than I did, and I really, I really wish I'd seen it sooner. So I'm going to ask you to evaluate it. What you saw up here is not the reason why we fast. It's not, the re it's not, it's not, like, it's not like it's a test. It's not like a midterm exam. It's not the final exam. It is not the final condition to being, the, being in the kingdom of God. He's not keeping a record saying, well, you're going to barely make it. But you know, of the, of the 40 fast you've had, David Toman fast through the years, you broke it five times. I know one was a cracker. One was a sip of water when you forgot. But you know, I'm keeping tabs. I'm keeping score. And this is really going to determine my love for you. You know, I really... I really can't love you unless you fast 24 hours like you think you're supposed to. If you make a mistake and, and if you take some blood pressure medication, I'm sorry, I, I can no longer love you. I, 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 you can't be in my kingdom anymore. I'm sorry. You, know, I, you took that blood pressure medication. You, you will not be in my kingdom. Now, I hope if people get this, they don't clip that out of context and think that's what I'm really teaching. I'm being sarcastic to make a point. That's not the kind of God we worship. So let's read the job the priest had to do real quickly. Let's go to Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. What was the job that day? The day of atonement. 
Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generation. It is most holy to the Lord. So we go to Leviticus 16, verse 2. What was the job of the high priest? Leviticus 16, verse 2. Back in that system, this is absolutely true. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at simply any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or else he's going to die. I have strict instructions for that physical high priest in that old covenant system. He cannot go in there. He better not go in there. If someone throws a dollar in there, he better not go chase it. If, so, if, so, if, if he sees one of his whatever and the friend go in there, he better not go in there to get his friend. He better not go in, that, in behind that curtain. For I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Now let's just go to a few scriptures in Hebrews. We, we, we're going to really look at Hebrews 8 and 9. But let's look at a few scriptures in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. The whole, of course, the whole book's going to be at the role, about the role of the Son of God, the role of the Son of God in God's plan, and how he's going to really re take on a lot of the symbolism of the Old Testament. He is the sacrifice. He is the high priest. I mean, he's, he's just everything. And that's great. We want him to be all in all. That's, us, that's how God designs it. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So he became one who had to live like we do. How, how we have lived, how we still live. How we live before we were baptized and how we live after we're baptized. He became like us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The conclusion of this, verse 16, of this little concept right here, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Brethren, some of you are too passive in going to God's throne. Some of you are too passive to talk to your father. Some of you are too passive to negotiate with your father like Abraham did. Some of you are too passive to negotiate with your father like Moses did. Some of you are too passive to talk to your father like the Apostle Paul did. Some of you wouldn't have the heartfelt emotion to talk to your father like Jesus, the Son of God, did. Go before the throne of grace. Boldly before the throne of grace. Talk about the promises he's made because he will not back down from a promise. We disappoint each other all the time. God does not disappoint. God fulfills his promises. And as I said before, the, I think the biggest problem with faith is people misinterpret the promises. There's a lot of people who say, well, I believe this because and then, they'll, then they'll quote the reason why they believe something. And I might sit there and say, I don't think that's a promise. I don't think you're quite seeing those words clearly. But they're very zealous toward it because they interpret those words as a promise. And of course, they're gonna, if they're going to be, want to be faithful, they're going to follow the interpretation. So I think if we, if we misinterpret what we're reading, then we can get off. Our zeal can get us in the wrong direction. We can be self-righteous. Those people who walked on their knees down in Mexico, they looked at these Bible, they look at scriptures in the Bible, and they believe those scriptures influenced them to do what they did, what they do. And we do the same thing. The way we observe 
all, anything we try to do, we're, we're doing it based on our, our perception of what we think this book is telling us. And, but we know that we change through the years. We know that we see th things better. And so what I'm telling you, while I'm, I'm a supporter of fasting on the Day of Atonement, I'm hoping we find the better reasons to fast on the Day of Atonement. Because I don't think if you're trying to measure up to God and trying to prove something to God and, and trying, to, trying to get an A plus or trying to get an Eagle Scout or if you're trying to get an award or certificate with God or if you're trying to earn his love, I think again you're reacting to how you've been treated through your life. You've been not given appropriate love. You've been not given appropriate validation. And so thereby, we construct our lives to find ways to validate our life. Some people validate their life through alcohol, some through drugs, some through serving. They just, they have to, they think if they serve, it'll make up for some lack in their life some way. God will love me. I, I, I've disappointed God, but if I just do this or I do that, then God, God will forgive me. Really? You think God's forgiveness is based on how many hours you do serving? You think your forgiveness is based on how many minutes you do praying? You, you think your forgiveness is based on how well you fast, how long you fast, how difficult you make it? You think your forgiveness is based on those choices? That's really the way, and yeah, I, I get it. I, I know what these books says. And I, even, I even know scriptures that make people think that. But they have to keep in mind who God is and how God works. And brethren, I encourage you again, God is a perfect father. If we as imperfect fathers can figure things out, let's understand that the perfect dad, he's got it down. He sets the example for us. And we don't want to view God as a genie in a bottle. Uh, we don't want to view God as a slave to our whims. We don't want to view God as whatever. We want to view God as the perfect father who loves us who gives us instructions because he, he wants us to be blessed. He doesn't give us instructions so we can feel better than other people. If we, if we start feeling better than other people, we're missing the mark of why God wants us to obey, why God wants us to listen, what God's trying to do. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. As I've mentioned many times, I'd like to mention again, right in the middle of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, God's, I mean, the writer of Hebrews stops and he tells them what we've been trying to accomplish. It's almost like, if he's almost like saying, if you're not getting what I'm saying, let me say it clearly. So if people say, Dave, you seem pretty confident about what you think the book of Hebrews is saying. Yes, I am pretty confident about what the book of Hebrews is saying. And Hebrews 8.1 helps me to be confident about that. Because he says, this is the main point. You may have gotten some other good stuff out of it. You may have gotten some other learning things, other truth, other lessons, other values. This is the main point. We have a high priest who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesties in the heavens. We look back to the high priest who had a job to do. He did it on the Day of Atonement. And now we look at our high priest who is doing a job. Can we see the greater blessing of our high priest over the Leviticus high priest? That's what this book's about. He's a minister of the sanctuary. He's a minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, no man erected. Every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it's necessary that this one also have something to offer. And our high priest offered his life. He offered his breath. He took our spot. And so it was really great that the physical high priest went in there on the Day of Atonement and did what he did. It was important. It was an instruction. But we don't live by that instruction. We, yes, we do observe the Day of Atonement, but it gives us a chance to reflect back on what happened back then, but not even so much what happened back then. How does it help us today what is it doing for us today verse 6 now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he also is a mediator of a better covenant so if someone asks you and they'll ask you this do you think the new covenant is better and some people get defensive like what am i supposed to say i would quote the book of hebrews and say yes 
it's a better covenant. Now, when you admit something's a better covenant, that doesn't mean the first covenant was bad. If, but if we're going to quote the Bible, we're going to say the, this new covenant is a better covenant. It is better. But sometimes you find people in the church of God who don't want, they almost want to think the covenants are equal. That's just not true. But they're afraid that if you admit the new covenant is better, that somehow you don't like the old covenant. Why would, we, why would we not like the old covenant? But why do we think the new covenant is better? Because he says it. The new covenant is better. It was established on what? Better promises. Understanding the promises is the key to having the right faith. Many people do not understand the right promise, so they have faith in a wrong promise, and then they wonder why it's not going so well. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to have a second covenant. Well, what was the problem? Verse 8, the problem was with the people. Well, this is a way of saying the people couldn't do the first covenant the way it could have been done or should have been done. So God, actually in the second covenant, he made it tougher, but he also gave us help. I mean, I mean if he made it tougher, that would be worse. Like, oh man, we, we couldn't do the first one, and now he's made the second one tougher. Because now, now we, if we even lust after a woman, it's a problem. Now if we, if we get angry with our cause, it's a problem. It's, this is even tougher. But the point is, the, tough, the increased toughness is outweighed by the help of the Holy Spirit the hope of the Holy Spirit, this new relationship, the expanded relationship, makes it better. Chapter 9, which was read in my scripture reading. There indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in, earthly sanctuary, in the earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was prepared. The first part of it was the lampstand, the table, the showbread. It's called the, the sanctuary. But behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle is called the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. Also was the golden pot that had the manna. Aaron's rod was there, it budded. The tablets of the covenant was there. And above it were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing of the mercy seat, a real fancy lid, a fancy lid made of gold. Of these things, we can't tell you. I mean, I can try to explain it to you, but I can't do it justice, he said. And that's true. And sometimes the writers did a pretty good job. But even when they did a good job, it really couldn't explain it completely. Verse 6, now when these things had been prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle during the performing the services. But into the second part of the high, the high priest went alone once a year on the Day of Atonement. Not without blood, because he had to make a sacrifice for himself and for the people. Now our high priest didn't really have to make a sacrifice for himself because he never sinned. But he became the sacrifice. And so once a year we don't have a reenactment of the sacrifice. Actually, we do have a, a Passover time. We do have a little bit of reminder through the symbols. I guess we have a little reminder then. And I, I, I view this day like the Passover service. This is, this is a day to really reflect on the sacrifice that was made for us. Because the high priest had a job to do. He did it. And our high priest had a job to do. He did it. And we still are reaping the benefits of what he has done. Now, it's talked down verse 9. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot be made him who performed the service in regard, perfect in regard to the, the conscience. Verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. And he, he didn't come with the blood of goats and calves, he came with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, if that sprinkling the unclean, if that sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more does the blood of Christ? 
if the blood of bulls and goats and all the, all the blood of heifers, all the, all the blood was valuable, and it was. How much more is the blood of the Savior? Because he came, offered himself to God. He was up without blemish. And through this, folks, we can have our dead works removed so we can serve the living God. We, God is not interested so much on how hungry did you get on the Day of Atonement? What did you happen to sip? God is more concerned about your works yesterday and tomorrow. Not even that he's trying to judge you so harshly, but he says, I want you to be my kid. You're my son. You're my daughter. How did you help that person yesterday? Son, I'd like you to do a better job tomorrow. And when you go to the feast, I'd like you to think about more of the plan of salvation. But come home after you have a wonderful feast. And how is it going to change your life? How is your life growing? How is your life changing? How are you becoming more like me, your dad, would God be talking, God would be saying? Well, we, we go down. There's so much to read here. Let's go down to verse 20, uh, 25, 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. The heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but he's entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it's appointed for men to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, again, apart from sin, for salvation. I just want to leave you with this as you think about it. I'd like to leave you with a thought. Why are you fasting today? It's not to impress God. It's not to impress the person sitting beside you. It's not to make you feel better about yourself. It's not to make you feel more worthy. It's not to help you think that you now earn something for the kingdom of God. Those are all bad reasons to fast today. Maybe you're fasting today because it's a tool it's a very valuable tool. And maybe your fasting today is to remind you of this tool that helps you to succeed in life, to love God and serve others. Not a value of worth, but a value of a tool. That would, that would make sense to me. If that's why you fast, that's great. But I'd like to leave you with one other thought. It may seem radical to you at first. Maybe the reason you're fasting today is you're telling the Father and your high priest, thank you for what all you've done. 